Perfect. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So Stefan is going to talk about fractons on curve spaces and their soft charges. So over to you, Stefan. Uh, I think your video has frozen. Uh oh. Frozen? Let, maybe let me start. Can can you hear me? Yes. Now it's good. Yes. Yeah. yeah. OK, so so maybe let's try to do this without video for now. Sure. Okay. Or maybe or try, let's give it a start and if it's frozen. Like uh, can do that. Can you frozen hear me? and yeah, yeah, it's uh, frozen. yeah, yeah, I couldn't. Your audio is all right. Yeah, okay. no, so I hope you can hear me. Yes, now and I can uh, yeah. let me start by thanking the organizers for the kind invitation. And it's great to be back in Bangalore. Uh, I've been here already um, quite some time ago for spring 2015. And um, it's hard to, to see, I guess, but uh, I should be the pixel down here. And I enjoyed uh, Bangalore a lot. It was a great city and uh, enjoyed the great food and uh, nice hospitality here. So it's great to be back, at least virtually. Um, the promise of today is to some extent, I want to talk about and I want to explain to you the consequences and theories with dipole symmetry. And I hope in the end you will understand a little bit the underlying symmetries. Uh oh, uh, I think you got disconnected. Mm -hmm. uh, Hi, Stefan. Are you back? Hello. Sorry, I'm back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah <laughs> horrible. Yeah, sorry. I... Um, can you can you hear me again now? Yes, I can yeah. hear you and see the screen. I think we can keep the screen like this. Uh, whatever is working is working now. I think. <laughs> so okay, I think perfect. now you know even before the, you know right now it's perfect. So I think whatever you are doing right now, just continue with that. Yeah. I think. Okay. Perfect. OK, so but can could you hear me? So, so I, I was already in Bangalore. Did, did, did you see this part? Yeah, the, or that, was this... Yes, I, I heard this part, yes. So OK, was, good, uh, great. Yeah, so <laughs> so think, let's yeah. let's continue with the promise. And um, yeah. so I want you to under, in the end, you should understand the consequences and theories with dipole symmetry and also to understand the underlying symmetries. And there are some kind of interesting connections to high energy physics. And I hope I will also be able to convince you that uh, new developments of kind of asymptotic symmetries and infrared properties can be can generalized to this kind of condensed matter systems. And you might even realize that there is much more to be done and find your possibly even some kind of research area or project in this kind of theories, because this is at least to my understanding a field where there's quite a lot of room for exploration at this point. Um, in general, I will not have a lot of references throughout the talk to reduce clutter, and I only wanted to, I want this to be somehow a little bit like, um, I want to show you more the results rather than giving you a broad overview and go too much into the details. But I, I still want to somehow uh, highlight my reference, uh, my collaborators, which are, um, on the first part, I will talk about the theories with dipole symmetry, and there I worked with Leo Bidusi, Yele Hatong, Emil Have, and Jürgen. Boseos. And in the second part, I will uh, talk about asymptotic symmetries of this kind of theories. And this is based on work with Alfredo Perez. And finally, there will be a short uh, discussion about um, the underlying exotic symmetries and some possible generalization. And this is based on a paper with Jose Figueroa Farrell and Ross Gracie. So as I said already in general, there will be not a lot of uh, references throughout the talk, but let me still highlight two very nice reviews, which is uh, the following here at the bottom, which you can look at, and there are a lot of interesting ideas already to start off. And in general, please uh, feel free to ask questions and provide any comments. I very much encourage this along the road, so there should be enough time. I, I will not use the whole hour, I guess. So please don't hesitate to, 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 to ask or say anything. With this, uh, 
let's start and maybe let me start with a disclaimer. Fractons has, is a, by now a very broad topic and fractons is a little bit like of an umbrella term for all kind of different um, theories. And when I talk about fractons, I will focus on theories which are continuous field theories. There's huge literature on, on, on flat lattice theories and so on and so forth. But when I will talk about fractons, I mean usually continuous field theories. And I will also use it synonymously with a dipole symmetry. And with that, let me maybe introduce you with a, and let's start with a motivation on dipole symmetry and some of its consequences. So, what are fractons in this kind of context? They are quasi particles and they have the characteristic feature of having restricted mobility. At this point, they are still theoretical, so they are not realized yet in the lab. And the restricted mobility comes due to some kind of interesting conservation laws. These theories have a conserved charge, and that is something you, you might know very well from electrodynamics. But they have something additional, which is something unusual, and this is a conserved dipole moment and this conservation law. So let me say that it's not unusual to have a conserved dipole, uh, have a dipole moment. What is really the interesting aspect, and some of it can be traced back to this kind of conservation law, is the conservation law res with regard to it. So let's try to, to understand these consequences with some very simple uh, examples, which should now already show you what the kind of consequences come from this conservation law. And with that, let's start with a, just a single charge and see what these conservation laws tell you. So as a first, let's put this single charge here at the origin. And let's just take like a negatively uh, charged particle. And the density is now given by the following. And the charge can be easily computed and it's just uh, minus Q. And you, we can also compute the dipole moment, which is just the density in integrated here. And that leads due to the delta function just to zero. OK. So these are just the quantities. And now let's see what would happen if we if this charge would, let's say, move to another position, which is here. Then we would have a uh, density which has the following form. And as you can easily convince yourself, the charge is still minus Q. So this conservation law we're fine with regard to charge conservation. But what is an interesting aspect is, since it is now not at the origin anymore, we find that the dipole moment has changed and it's now minus Q. All right, so, so but since you want the dipole moment to be conserved, we see that there is a dead tension between these two. So the dipole moment is not conserved. And this already tells you one thing. Since the theories, since our theories should have a conserved dipole moment, a single charge cannot move. So this is not allowed. And as you hopefully also have realized, this is really related to the conservation of the dipole moment, which changes if the charge moves. All right, so let, now let's look at something else, which is a dipole, and see what kind of consequences the conservation laws have for a dipole. And let's put here a positive charge and here a negative one. All right, so the charge density is then given by a positive charge at the origin and a negative charge at a point that is moved. So the charge is uh, hopefully clear. The charge is zero. And the dipole moment 
is given by uh, zero and the charge here. OK, so now let's see what the conservation laws imply for a uh, dipole. Oops, sorry, this is. And let's move it in this direction just for. And uh, just just to be explicit for this for this first part. Let me just show you. All right. OK, so what is interesting now is the charge is still zero, so there's no tension with the charge conservation law. And what is again interesting is, as you can easily convince yourself, is the dipole moment has now these two. Components and in the end. Is given by the same quantity, so as you can see, there is no tension in the console uh, with dipole conservation. And you can basically also depict this by basically, oops, sorry, by thinking about this with the dipole vector, which is the same in both cases. So as you can infer from this kind of conservation law is that dipoles can move, but they cannot rotate. For example, what you cannot do is, you, what is not allowed is to, to have a con to have something like this suddenly from from here to here that is disallowed so with this i think we can now uh, conclude that dipoles can move but they are not allowed to rotate so to, to picture this like in a in a universe with time here you would have your dipole that is allowed to move but your vector should always stay the same All right, with this, um, let me end this motivational part to some extent and do it with a small riddle. How can a single charge move? And there is a, some way out to it. What needs to happen to have to satisfy both uh, conservation laws? So you, you, you start with a charge at the origin, and you really want to have the charge at this position. And you still want to satisfy both conservation laws. What has to happen to be able to satisfy both of these conservation laws? I give you some time to think about it. Maybe somebody is even brave enough to, to give it a guess. You have to produce other charges. Correct, exactly. And the important part, you, you also said it already, um, you're not allowed to change the charges. So what you have to produce is another dipole. So you have to produce a dipole, which has, which exactly has again zero charge. So we have zero charge in the end again. Uh, sorry, we have positive charge, we have charge Q, a minus Q at the start and at the end. And since the dipole is plus and minus, it's still minus Q. And it has the opposite of the dipole. So in total, we also have a dipole conservation. And that is a way out. But of course, this takes to some extent, like if you think about it, this would, this would take some energy to produce this kind of particles. So that is a way out. And that is also something that is possible in principle in this kind of theories. But OK, with that, I, I hope you, I have like a little bit like given you the spirit of this, this kind of models and what this dipole conservation law and some kind of what kind of restrictions this puts on your theory. So they are quasi particles with uh, restricted mobility. And one way to think about it, and this is by, by far not the only way, but this is one of the ways uh, I, I will talk about is really the connection to di dipole conservation. And this really leads to mobility for single charges is restricted. So they're really like stuck pinned to a point for low energies, if you like to think about it that way. And dipoles can in principle move, but they cannot rotate due to this conservation law. And of already at this point, you, 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 you might uh, a little bit like come to some interesting conclusions in a sense. 
yeah, this was not dipole conservation. What about other conservation laws that you can like think about, like quadrupole moment or some kind of different ways to produce dipole moments? And of course, people have thought about this also with different kind of charges and different, and this leads to different kind of mobility restrictions. For example, there's something called linions, which are particles that are just allowed to move in the direction of the vector or planons, which are just allowed to move in the plane or something like this. So different conservation laws might then lead to different kind of physics. OK, so that was some of the motivational part. Um, are there any questions with regard to this part? If not, uh, let's try to, to see what kind of theories we, we can produce that have some kind of dipole symmetry. And so let's so maybe I'll ask one uh, general. Yeah, yeah, sure, uh, sure. So the so if if uh, so does it mean that these theories uh, have to be interacting? Like, uh, well, I mean, if they have to have any dynamics at all, does it? Does mm -hmm. that mean, like, for instance, you said, you know, when you said the, drew the picture, like, mm -hmm. uh, if you want these things to move, then you have mm -hmm. to create a, another dipole. Right? Yeah. So does it mean that uh, is that does it mean that they are interacting theories in some sense, or am I saying nonsense? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Let me think. Yeah, L let me maybe show you the theories, and maybe you can infer your, okay. your answer yeah. yourself. Okay. I, yeah. I think to some extent, I think you have a good point in here, okay. in the sense that uh, it's. There is a tricky point between the free theory and the interacting theory that I, I will so show you now, and maybe we can talk about it later a little bit more. Okay, but sure. I, to some extent, I have to admit also these pictures very these, these pictures are very nice, but to put mm -hmm. them into actually clear formula right. is actually a hard problem. <laughs> also, and it's also, a little I, bit also... actually related to the, exactly what you just said. This there is a, a, quite a step between the free and the interacting yeah. theory that is quite non-trivial. Also, I think. From the when you started out, I think what you are mentioning that you are actually working with uh, field theories and not so much lattice models and so on, right? So I exactly, think field, yeah, theory, correct, yeah. field theories, I guess it will be harder to connect with that, that picture that you drew. Correct. Okay. I mean, to some extent, yeah. Uh, this 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 is uh, this is really meant more like as a motivational part. It's not yeah. so really so, so really to write down this in, in, with mm -hmm. operators is I think to some extent. People in the lattice community know this, but uh, it's not so easy from the continuous point of view. It's more like a, 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 I mainly wanted to motivate at least uh -huh. the, 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 how you can think about this, but uh, to put this into formula is a little bit trickier. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, maybe we can talk about this later. Yeah, 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 but sure. because uh, you will now see the, 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 where a little bit like the troubles come from. <laughs> and it, it is related to the meta theories. And now you want to theories that have this kind of dipole um, symmetry. And to have a theory with dipole symmetry, we showed that they're like, there's some kind of a little bit like of a no go result that only two of the following three can be fulfilled. And I will show you now in each case, like where two of the two are fulfilled and one of them isn't, for example. So, you can write down a theory with linearly realized dipole symmetry, with, by which I mean the following here. You can write down a, a theory which has spatial derivatives in the action or has a Gaussian action. And one way to realize such a theory is to have a Gaussian action with spatial derivatives in the action. And then you're led to some Lifshitz-like theories like the following given here. And you can see one thing that is in this case true. You have a DF dipole symmetry, but it's not linearly realized. This is so let, let me emphasize one thing. So, so this is like the U1 symmetry, the alpha part. And the beta is like is like the dipole symmetry. And it's not linearly realized because there is no phi here at the end. And these are Lifshitz like theories. So that is one way. I, I will not focus on this kind of theories. I will focus on the theories which have linearly realized type of symmetries. So, so and by this definition of uh, linearly realized, I mean, by any definition, I guess, but so I guess uh, a shift symmetry is not linearly realized, right? Correct. Yeah. This is like a shift symmetry. This is like, this is like an old story to some extent. 
exactly this like shift symmetries are exactly this like a shift symmetry with uh, that the sorry let me write it like this i guess this is what you mean by a shift symmetry and and this is just like a generalization with a dipole shift symmetry if yeah, you like yeah. i mean so there is like some is, old yeah. works by horava and so on that that looked at exactly even at at theories with even higher yeah, I, i'm just talking about something like an uh, axion for instance i think would have mm -hmm. a shift symmetry so that's that yeah, yeah. So that's so yeah okay so that's not so in near the way this so by linearly realized symmetry you just mean a phase rotation basically correct yeah but people are also looking at this Lifshitz like theories it's just not that the one I will focus on uh, at the remaining talk but it's again something where you can think about it in terms of dipole symmetry it has a sure, vector sure. that is conserved correct sure yeah and the other option is if you have like a linearly realized symmetry and you want to have spatial derivatives in the action, then you're led to the following popular model, and that is the one I will mostly focus on. And that is immediately some uh, interacting theory, if you want. Let me now describe a little bit like some of the features of this theory. First of all, as you can see, this term here, which is the usual gradient term that you're very used from your uh, Poincaré invariant theories, is forbidden to do this uh, linearly realized dipole symmetries. And if you want to have some spatial derivatives in the action, one uses the following um, object, which is immediately, as you can see, a non-Gaussian theory, which is immediately interacting. And this is a little bit like the, the, the tricky part, because it's, as you can see, it's, it's fourth order in phi, which is, and by Gaussian, it should be maximally of second order. And but this is now a theory that has dipole symmetry that is linearly realized and has spatial derivatives in the action. But if you want now a Gaussian action and to some extent the free model of this theory, you are led to something that is like a Carolian field theory. I will now soon describe you what this is, but you can see immediately that this is basically when you drop the interaction term. And then you are led to this free theory, which is a Carolian field theory. It's um, the simplest example of a Carolian field theory. Let me maybe just point, uh, explain you where this Carolian field theory come from, or some give you some motivation how to think about this Carolian field theories. And one way to think about it is it's a speed to light, light, speed of light to zero limit where the light concloses, and then basically this is the, the in this way this term that the Lorentzian gradient term basically drops out, and you're left with this Carolian field theory. Another way to think about it, and that is possibly more in the spirit of these fractons, is it also shows up in theories when it has like some ultra local limit where the points are, each of them is like on its own line in space time and is stuck to a point as well. So, this is also a way where Carolian field theories show up. And this is somehow the relation between the Carolian and Fractonian physics, or one relation between Carolian and Fracton physics that we made aware of. And this corona field theories show also up for physics on null surfaces. And in this sense, this is they also like relevant for flat space holography because cry is a null surface to some extent, and black hole horizons, which are also null surfaces. So these corona field theories show up also in this kind of context. But let me now focus may, uh, on this um, interacting theory. And let me tell you a little bit like one of the things that are very often very useful right from the start to understand is what are the symmetries of your theory? And this, there are two kinds of symmetries, if you like to think about it, which are like the space-time symmetries and the internal symmetries. And the space-time symmetries are given by uh, the rotations and the translations, the P's, and H is uh, the time translations, but they are completely commute with everything, but they are still there, There's a, this charge is there. And what is interesting now is, <clears throat> you also have these internal symmetries, if you like to think about the, that way, which are, um, which is the char electric charge and the dipole moment. And the dipole moment is a vector under rotations, as you might have somehow anticipated, and it also doesn't commute with the translations and leads to the charge. And there are like two things you might already find uh, unusual at this point is, first of all, there is no boost symmetry. 
So usually you would expect some kind of Lorentzian boost symmetries or even let's say some Galilean boosts, but this theory does not possess any boost symmetry. And that's the reason that the underlying geometry can already anticipate it to be something that is called Aristotelian geometry. But basically definition, this is a theories which have just rotations, spatial and temporal translations. And there's also something interesting that you might also be a little bit unfamiliar, which is the space-time symmetries mixed with the internal symmetries, which are that, which is basically this part here. And this is something we, that one can call like exotic space-time symmetries. And that is something that is unusual for Poincaré symmetries because there the coleman mandula theorem to some extent, I will come back later to this at some point, forbids this kind of interactions for the theories that are part of these theorems. Okay. So, so that was so, to some extent the fractonic meta theory, the meta part. And now you might wonder, similarly like to electrodynamics, is there some kind of gate theory that could mediate the forces between these meta theories? And indeed there is. One can to some extent gauge this dipole symmetry and obtain a field theory. And let me now provide you the simplest theory and their field content. And <clears throat> the gauge theory is given by a, a scalar and a symmetric tensor field, IJ, and IJ are spatial indices, not Lorentz indices. And this theory has the following possibly unconventional gauge symmetry. Let me emphasize that there are like two derivatives, which is something possibly not very, at least I have not been aware of theories, a lot of theories that have this kind of feature. <clears throat> but there are, of course, some connections to high energy physics that I will tell you later a little bit more about. And given these gauge symmetries, you can now construct uh, electric and magnetic field strength, and they are invariant under the gauge symmetries. And having this electric and magnetic field strength, you can then write down a theory that is given by the following form. And to some extent, as you can see, it mirrors a little bit electrodynamics because it has it's electrodynamics with two in, two indices to some extent. And there are like a few, this theory has a few funny similarities with a few different kind of theories. It shares similarities with electrodynamics because it has some kind of abelian gauge symmetry. But it also shares some similarities with linearized general relativity because there is a symmetric rank two field, but it's just spatial in this part. And there's another interesting connection, which is also shares in general some similarities with, which is like partially massless gravitons, because these partially massless gravitons also have some two derivatives. So that these are theor theories that just live in ADS or DS spaces. And they also have some kind, they share some interesting similarities with regard to the gauge structure in general. If you look very carefully at this stretch, so that this theory lives in between these three cases to some extent, if you like to think about it in that way, and has some features from each of them. OK, so there is some gauge theory. So there is a meta theory and a gauge theory, and having these two cases, there is one question you can may wonder about it. Indeed, people have wondered about it, and is the question, can you couple these theories to curved space? But before I go there, are there some questions with regard to these two theories? Yeah, so I, I didn't quite see how you were coupling the, the matter fracton to the... Ah, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so the coupling was... Um, I, I didn't write it down explicitly. Let me... Let, so the coupling is... You have a, a current and a dipole current and... Oops, sorry. So the coupling is given I, I, by... I, 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 uh, I guess it is just the derivative, corresponding derivatives get shifted by the lambda. So, uh, by the exactly. Uh, it, it, it's like uh, the A, the, 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 the meta theory has like a phi zero and a phi ij component, like mm -hmm. a current, and they are coupled with regard to the aij and the. Okay. Okay, okay. So, so that is the coupling, and, and this, I didn't write down the j0 and the yeah, jij. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Thank but you. this is, and they are symmetric. But these are like, this is exactly, it, it very much mirrors electrodynamics to some extent in this regard. I hope this is clear, good. So, all right. 
any other questions concerning these theories? OK, great, then let's let's continue um, and, and go to the coupling to curved space time. And that is a question that people ask for various reasons. And <clears throat> one of them is as a test of self consistency or to, to, to search for anomalies. One, 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 one way that is, I think, quite familiar to a lot of people is, is to understand the sources for the electric energy momentum tensor. It's really like similarly to the computation that a lot of people do to find the energy momentum. Momentum and that is often a very useful way to get the energy momentum currents. And it's also a step to understand fluid descriptions. People are expert in this, but at least another motivation to look at curved space time. And I will spend a lot of the details here because it's quite um, technical. And I will just tell you the result and the state of the art. Um, and you might I have already. I, I think your slide because is I told you a little bit about it. Is this theory has no post symmetry, so you will not have <laughs> something <laughs> that is really uh, like Riemannian geometry or I, I think Riemannian geometry. <clears throat> it's the theory. Can you hear me? The, 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 the geometry that you couple it to yeah, is something uh, called Aristotelian geometry. Stefan. Uh, and just to give you a taste, rather than having this non-degenerate metric that we are very familiar oh. with. It is exchanged for a few objects. One of them is like a clock one form, and one of them is a. Okay, I think he is now disconnected, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think then he will come to back to his senses. Yeah. I think he'll come yeah. back. So I think it's good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's uh, Sorry, I'm right? back again. Yeah, yeah, but I think uh, we, uh, I think you are at the stage we are talking about the coupling, the stress tensor, and the, uh, you know. Perfect, uh, here. Uh, okay, good. Thought. So I think we, this slide, I think we didn't see. Yeah, I think. All we right, that, you, can, you can start from the beginning of this slide and you're good. Perfect, thanks a lot. Yeah, sorry. You would be surprised that I have the most expensive internet here at this connection. <laughs> what a disappointment. All right, uh, okay, so. Um, so there are different motivations for looking at the coupling to curved space times, but already as uh, already told you, these theories have no boost symmetry. So the right framework to, to couple to is something called Aristotelian geometry. And I spare you uh, the details. They are very in a lot of details in our paper. And I think it, it, it it's, I will just give you the spirit of how it works. And then you can look at the details if you're interested in. And since it's, Aristotelian geometry, the non degenerate metric that everybody's very familiar with from Riemannian geometry, is exchanged for something else. And this is not just one object, but a few objects. And this is the clock one form and the spatial metric, which has signature 0, 1, 1, 1. You can think about it a little bit like this you exchange the metric for something that it, you can build the metric out from out of two objects, if you like. And if you would impose Lorentz symmetry, these two objects would somehow be free, freeze together or um, build. you could build out of these two objects the metric that you everybody likes and loves. But since there is no boost symmetry, these two objects are in principle independent. And in this sense, you also exchange the integration measure for something like this. And you also have, can put, um, create something like an inverse metric data, which is then given by these two objects. And having this Aristotelian geometry now, you can try to couple this theory to this kind of Aristotelian geometry. And indeed... So, so, so that V mu is defined by the fact that H upper mu nu is the inverse of H lower mu nu, is it? Exactly, yeah, correct. Yeah. So you have now this... So, so this, this to some extent, this whole object is the inverse of this whole object there. Yeah. And the H minu is also inverse of H. Okay. And having these objects now, you can indeed couple the matter sector, and that is something um, people haven't been aware of before. And 
you can see that there are now this this kind of channelized objects in here. You have like a, these V's, you have this projector, which is defined as follows. And you also have like a covariant derivative, which is with regard to some kind of Aristotelian connection, which is quite a complicated object, but in general you can do it. And indeed this theory can really be uh, curved to a general Aristotelian geometry. And in this sense, this is quite um, to some extent straightforward when you have uh, when you have mastered a little bit the Aristotelian geometry um, and works quite smoothly. But a possibly more interesting aspect is that for the gauge theory, this is not as easy and actually it's just possible to couple them to a restricted class of curved geometries. And this is due to a tension between the general, the coupling to channel curved Aristotelian space times and their gauge symmetry. Let me just show you where the, 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 some of the problem lies to some extent. And that the problem lies to some extent but in, in the magnetic part of the theory, if you like. And the magnetic tensor in any dimension is given by the following object, where D again is some kind of covariant derivative. And the generalized um, gauge transformation on curved space time is here. And here, the, to some extent, the two derivatives play an important role because the magnetic tensor transforms under gauge transformation as follows. And you see already here that there is a Riemann tensor in flat space. This means if the, the Riemann tensor would vanish and you would have the usual gauge invariant magnetic tensor. But here, if since there is um, curved geometries, you see immediately that the magnetic tensor is not a uh, gauge invariant anymore. And this, so, so, so this IJK indices are only the spatial directions, correct? Spatial, correct. Yeah, yeah. Here I've restricted also, to. Yeah. Yeah. I also this. Uh, what is this capital DI? I think I missed that. Yeah. Sorry. The capital the DI is uh, is some kind of um, spatial um, covariant derivative with respect to some kind of Aristotelian geometry. It's oh, quite sorry. a complicated object okay. built right. out of right. a lot of different fine, things, fine, but it's fine. like the generalization that you have for Aristotelian. I've, I've spared okay. the details. It's like a <laughs> whole line here, <laughs> but it's it's, no, no, it's, it's no, just no. exactly. But I, but I agree. It's it, it is what you I expect. Just to know to what be. it does. Yeah. yeah. No, no, perfect. No, no. Thanks for the question. Okay, yeah, please <laughs> ask all the time. Was there another question? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. Okay, great. Yeah, but please go ahead and and ask all these questions because uh, of course this. Uh, important questions and correct. Yeah, you have some kind of channelization of this Levi Civita connection, which is built out not from the metric, but from this all, all these other objects. And all right, it's there is some way to cure this in some specific classes. You can add some trace terms to the actions, and you can find some channelization which is gauge invariant on some specific backgrounds, but not on channels backgrounds, which was possible for the meta part. And so to some extent, this is still a little bit of an open problem to couple this to general Aristotelian geometry. And in this sense, you might again find some similarity with the higher spin theories for experts that have thought about higher spin theories that you can just provide this on ADS and DS spaces or something like partially massless gravitons again, which is just well defined on, on some specific classes of backgrounds. And it's again shares some quite some interesting features with this kind of high energy physics related context. OK, so this was uh, somehow the state of the art. And um, in this sense, we were able somehow to, to uh, use some tools that we come from the high energy point of view that people from the condensed meta point I think we're not so familiar with. And this is also a nice start for some for the for, for the second part to some extent where we also try to import some some tools from the high energy community of recent years into the condensed meta community. Um, before I go there, are there some questions with regard to the coupling to curved space time? OK, great. So then let's talk about asymptotic symmetries and soft charges. So having this, uh, this gauge theory, or even on flat space, is interesting to some extent because 
let me give you some features and then already you might already anticipate uh, what we are going to do. It's a gauge theory and it has also gapless propagating degrees of freedom, which is exactly like to some extent electrodynamics and general relativity. And as we know also from the general relativity and the electrodynamics, this theories, gauge theories with gapless propagating degrees of freedom, the definition of isolated systems and its symmetries is subtle. In particularly, on a non-compact space, it depends on, on boundary conditions and it leads to surface charges and infinity. And there might be different competing definitions of isolated charges, uh, isolated system or a very simple one, for example, for uh, isolated systems in the Newtonian gravity is quite simple. You, you, it falls off one over R to infinity. But for general relativity, this is to some extent something people are still working on, as I'm sure people from the audience can tell you. And <clears throat> in general, actually, there, there has been an interesting paper by um, Gorantan, Lam, Cyborg and Shao, and where they looked this, at this kind of theories on compact space, but they also already anticipate that their the notion of gauge charge depends on boundary conditions and in non-compact space we can discuss the total gauge charge measured and infinity. And this is exactly what I want to talk about now. How we can, if there is some kind of notion of these isolated systems and do you have this kind of gauge charges? And for that you have to provide some kind of reasonable asymptotic boundary conditions. And maybe let me try to give you a bigger picture of what, what this uh, is about. So there, that there has in recent years been some interesting structures with regard to infrared triangles by Strominger and company. And the, the, there is are relations between asymptotic symmetries, memory effects and soft theorems. And the question is, can we actually have this kind of infrared triangles beyond Lorentz symmetry? Because this theory, as I just showed you, is has not even Lorentz boost. So the question is, does these triangles persist in this kind of context? And another question is, um, can we then even use this to measure some of this kind of interrelations in the lab? Possibly this would, of course, open the possibility. <clears throat> so with that, um, let's look at this theory. And indeed, we were able to find consistent boundary conditions. This means that these boundary conditions should have um, should be um, should be um, good enough to ac ac accommodate all well-known solutions. For example, for electrodynamics, you want to have the Coulomb solution as part of your field uh, of your phase space, but it should also be strong enough to have well-defined charges that are finite. For example, if you allow um, fields that grow radially, you will have charges that might blow up. I think he has again frozen. And we... Can you hear me? Uh, I think uh, you, you were uh, not audible for a few seconds there. Can you hear me? Hello? Uh, I think, yeah, I think I fine. cannot see you. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, but uh, I think I think we can hear you. My apologies. Yeah. Uh, All right. Sorry again. No, that's fine. Can you hear me again? Yeah, we can see. Yeah, we can hear. Yes, we can hear you. Where did I cut off? Sorry. <laughs> uh, I think you were talking about the algebra. Just talking about the fraction. Okay, algebra. perfect. So I started here. Okay, perfect. Thanks. My apologies again. Uh, so, um, so as a first step, as I already said, and. Uh, these asymptotic uh, boundary conditions, there is in general 
no uniqueness to them. You can they can have different you can have different definitions and they might be competing in some sense, be useful for different kind of contexts. And indeed, the first set of boundary conditions that we find leads exactly to the fracton symmetry algebra that you would expect. Let me maybe tell you this symmetry algebra here should be thought of as Poisson brackets, and they're different in terms of this is now really for the gauge theory sector, not the matter sector. And it, this is much more subtle with regard to the matter sector, which is much more straightforward. And what we have also done as a next step is we have looked at these recent advances and ask, is there also some kind of soft extension to it? And indeed, there are some kind of fracton super translation, if you like to think about it, which is a, like an infinite extension of this fracton algebra. And indeed provides some kind of, it, it's very much mirrors exactly electrodynamics in general relativity and provides the first evidence that there might be something like a fract inferior triangles with, a, with something like a memory effect and soft theorems, if one can find it. All right, so that was part of the asymptotic symmetries. I have again spared you a lot of the details, but in general, I wanted that the interesting notion is these theories share some similarities with the theories we are used from high energy physics. And even though there is no Lorentz invariance, some of the features that we have learned to, 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 to possibly like in recent years and um, transport to this kind of setup. All right, so. Let me now come to some of <clears throat> the final part, which is a little bit like more like the channel kind of symmetries that underlie this kind of theories. And that is, um, as I already said, these are some kind of exotic space-time symmetries. And they are somewhat unfamiliar, possibly, at least for me, they were a little bit unfamiliar because in as soon as you have Poincaré invariant theories, there is the coleman mandula theory, which says that only possible that the only possible Lie group symmetries are direct products of the Poincaré group and an internal symmetry group. So this really is you have the space-time symmetries Poincaré, and you then you have the internal symmetries and they don't talk to each other. And exactly this fracton symmetry is a, a, a very nice counterexample to it, where the first line is the space-time symmetries, and the second line is really such a interaction, if you like, between the internal and the space-time symmetries. And I think it's a very natural question to ask, and people have, of course, asked this question. There are some interesting works by Gromov on multipole algebras and some things like this. What else are there? Can we have some kind of different interacting theories since now we don't have this restriction by Coleman Mandula? What else is out there? <clears throat> and we have asked this question at we have really tried to, to, to look at the simplest case by just looking at the theories which have like rotations and time and spatial translations and just add one charge as a start. And we have then completely classified the symmetries by Lie algebraic tools by something called Lie algebra deformation. And you can then write down all possible consistent Lie algebras. And let me maybe just provide you one um, non-trivial uh, aspect of it. And that is, when I say non-trivial, I mean there should not be a direct product between the charge and the space-time symmetries. There should be some interaction term, if you like. And this is the tri most trivial example I can, you can write down. And already here, you can see that the, 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 the interesting term is here, the HQQ. And what we have shown is that, first of all, if you want to have one charge and uh, this kind of uh, rotation, spatial and temporal translations, you will always have in a generic dimension exactly this term if you want to have non-trivial exotic space-time symmetries. And already this term, I've asked quite a few experts in the field, this is something that is or, or not very well known to some extent. And to some extent, we have the symmetries, but we have not a theory at this point which really accommodates this kind of symmetries. So there are again something quite unusual. Maybe there's something. So, 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 so yeah. there's no analog of dipole here, basically. Exactly, correct. So that, that is uh, the next step. So you can now ask, this was like the simplest theory. We have not just added a charge. 
And you can ask the next question is add a charge and a dipole charge. And then so classify in, in, all in, kinds in, of symmetry. In, in some sense, one would expect that these theories should be simpler than fractons, right? Correct, correct. That was exactly the idea. So we tried to see, all right, what is this is even the simplest theory, but what is mm -hmm. what are the consequences of it? And it's a little bit funny because this H correct. I mean the, the, the question was, yeah, this is a much more complicated. Let's look at exotic symmetries by even simpler setups and just add one charge and see what kind of doors this opens. And our result is that it always has some kind of HQQ term. Right, but uh, so are you able to write yeah. some Lagrangian uh, similar to that, uh, you know, so, sort of the fracton gauge theory that you wrote down? Exactly. No, that is exactly the uh, open problem at this point. We, 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 we started from the other end to some extent. We looked at what are even the possible symmetries, because it could have been that there is nothing, mm -hmm. but there is something. And this is the simplest thing in general I think you can write down. But it's true that the question now is what is the physics of this kind of theories? And to my best knowledge, I've asked a few experts in the field. Nobody has even thought about this. <laughs> and nobody has really provided me with a Lagrangian or said, yeah, this is the physics of this kind of theory. So, so to some extent, yeah. this yeah, is I, completely I guess it, 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 it feels a little bit like if you add the charge Q, you might add something else as well. It's also, you know, like. Yeah. In the in the case at least of the you know from the fracton gauge theory that you wrote down, yeah. it's almost like that, right? I mean, you had a key, yeah. but you also it came with the D automatically. Yeah. Yeah. In this regard, yeah, it, it's 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 it, yeah, it, it's a little bit interesting in the sense because the H, it's a little bit different because the the non-trivial computational relation is with the time translations, and this is a little bit something is a little bit trickier, in yeah. the sense because you yeah. It feels a little bit like, at least from the Hamiltonian point of view, it's a, it feels a little bit different. It's more like boost charges to some extent, which also have like an explicit time derivative in there or something. You see? So, so it's at least at this point, this is still an open problem. And to some extent, the interesting aspect is one could have expected or one expects this to be much simpler. It's just a, a theory which has one charge, but at this point, it's still uh, not very, this is not very well known. And the physics at this point is still very unclear. So it's a, wide open question for something, at, at least it seems to me very simple, but we, we don't know yet a theory realization of this kind of theories. And this is a, another interesting open pro problem in general. Okay, with that, let me summarize and give a little bit of an outlook and, and, and let me give you a little bit more ideas, things that might be interesting. So we have discussed fractons on curved space time. And I, I hope I have somehow transported a little bit like the consequences of dipole moment conservation. And a single charge to some extent is immobile, and but a dipole can move and rotate. And there are a lot of other interesting theories and restricted the conservation that people have to some extent already looked at, linons, planons, and so on. So and there are interesting theories which have even no rotation symmetry or some additional conservation laws. One very popular model in recent time is this theory, which has been looked at very carefully by Cyberg and Shao, which has no rotational symmetry and uh, some kind of interesting term here. And some kind of interesting properties like UV, IR mixing, and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> even for this theory, I think it's um, nobody has looked at what how to curve to, to, to couple this to curved space time. And there are some interesting relations to corollian physics, to partial massless gravitons, to GR, and to higher spin theories of this kind of theories. <clears throat> and then we have also talked a little bit about uh, soft charges of rectons. So there, the bigger question is, are there infrared triangles without Lorentz symmetries? And I think there are some kind of <clears throat> encouraging results. So there, there are some interesting asymptotic symmetries that very much generalize this uh, theory, but there are a lot of other fractonic theories and gauge theories which are not, which have different properties, but similar properties that you could expect them to also have some kind of infrared triangles. And we are currently looking also at the memory effect. And as far as we can see at this point, that there, there, there are also some kind of memory effects that are share some notions of the Lorentzian counterparts, but have some kind of interesting different notions as well. So. To some extent, uh, also this part seems to generalize to some extent. But there are much some other theories out there 
where I think there should also be some kind of interesting infrared triangles for con to condense metaphysics. And of course, in this sense, it's also might be interesting to include act actual physical boundaries like in condensed metaphysics systems and look at the symmetries of this kind of theories and bring them even closer to experiment. And then in the end, I have talked just a little bit about these exotic spacetime symmetries that underlie these theories. And the novel feature that these theories have, or maybe also some no, no, well known to some people, is that there are some non-trivial commutation relations between the spacetime symmetries and internal charges, which is a little bit unfamiliar for some, for at least for me, it was at the start. And we have completely classified this with a single scalar charge. And even the simplest case is at this point um, not very well understood. And <clears throat> as we discussed, of course, the, this can be generalized and we have uh, already done this uh, to some extent and some work in progress where we have look, classified all of them for just one dipole charge and then also for one dipole and uh, one electric charge to see what other fracton-like symmetry algebras there are. And indeed, there are some other cases and each of them, to some extent, I think people have only looked at the simplest case and started usually from the Lagrangian point of view. But to some extent, when you start from the symmetry point of view, you get a much broader class of possible theories. But then you have the problem, to some extent, the interesting open problem, how to construct theories that have this kind of symmetries. So it's, it would also be interesting to understand a little bit better how to systematically construct this kind of theories from some kind of uh, symmetry algebras. With that, um, let me thanks you for inviting me at least virtually to Bangalore. I hope we can meet in person at some point. Thank you. So yeah, so let's, uh, so any questions? I think, yeah, I think for the table. Yeah, are there any questions? Uh... I, I had uh, one more, you know, general question. So, um, please. So, for instance, uh, so is, uh, is it possible to construct uh, a non-abelian versions of these theories? That's an excellent question, and yes, um, people have looked into that. So, um, <clears throat> there are some kind of John Simons-like theories that people have looked a little bit into, mm -hmm. and there are also some kind of. Uh, I have to admit, I, I'm. I just know in these reviews there is a section on it, but I haven't uh, looked into the original works. But I think at least people have definitely tried to look at some kind of non-abelian versions, like Young Mills-like generalizations of these kind of theories. And I, I, at least to some extent, people have looked into that. But I agree there are a lot of routes you can take for this mm -hmm. kind of theories. And I think at least there's some some work in this direction. And this, I, I think it's an excellent question. So, um, and kind of related, so I was a little bit confused by how to think about, so for instance, you know, in, when you have electromagnetism and uh, yeah. in, in, in flat space, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, so the, so, so the, we don't, there is no mix, the Poincaré algebra is just there. And then there is, you have a gauge symmetry. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and somehow the theories are living in different super selection sectors of charges. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, like if you have a charge, then the charge is kind of eternally fixed in some sense. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but on the other hand, here it is like the structure is that, so when you have a gauge theory, this is a max, you know, this, uh, uh, you know, this fractonic gauge theory that you wrote down with the EI, mm -hmm. like EI, two E's and two J's, two, e, two E's and two, uh, you know, what is it, B or something, the, the, yeah. the, 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 the magnetic field. So that, mm -hmm. So that uh, that you're saying that the symmetry algebra basically takes the form that you have on the slide here. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So so okay. so you yeah. So that is the so so there are like two different sets of boundary conditions. Like for electrodynamics, mm -hmm. to some extent, you can have the original one where the charge is just like you just have the U1 charge. That's it. And then oh. you can have these additional soft charges, if you like, and, and these soft charges. Um, very much mirror exactly this expression here. They, they also don't translate, they don't, don't, they don't commute with the rotations, to my understanding, also in electrodynamics. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, so I, you know, so I like, uh, 
if you so if one had hopes of uh, thinking of this fractons or some mo mo models, I mean, one of the interesting things about fractons is they look like uh, somewhat uh, what do you call it, like uh, non-local type of theories, right? I mean, there's some there is yeah. something non-local about them. So, mm -hmm. and if I have heard people say that these are kind of potential, you know, something related, they, this may be um, kind of uh, interesting candidates for holography in flat space and so on. Mm -hmm. So, so I was wondering. So, if, if from that point of view, I think uh, computing asymptotic symmetries of fractons would be less interesting, wouldn't it? Because I mean, those are kind of like the holograms of these things. Yeah, that... I agree. Yeah, depend. So, 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 just to be sure, I understand the question correctly. You mean like they would be boundary theories to something in the bar? Right. I mean? If it is, if it is. I mean, of course. No, no, I agree. To, yeah. No, no, it, sure. It yeah, yeah. This is a different perspective. I mean, that this might be. Yeah. I, this is some, I have to admit, I, I'm not very familiar with this kind of uh, idea, but I agree. So, so this is more like the idea of trying to, to understand uh, infrared triangle from a condensed matter perspective and see how it generalizes. Yeah. From a holographic point of view, I think you would more like try to, to understand the bulk theories and how they connect to, to, to something right. like. So, yeah. yeah. I agree. So, uh, In that sense, yeah. you would probably more like try to see, try to understand the bound, the, the theories that it reduces to on the boundary and see in which sense they have some kind of fractonic. Yeah, so, so whether it can be construct like directly some sort of, you know, some analog of uh, the hologram of flat space directly. Yeah. That's the, that would be the kind of the big goal in some sense. Yeah. So, I agree. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, yeah, as far as I know, yeah, people have, to some extent, there, there are some works that, that have like at least holography and, and fractons in the title, but I'm not sure what they, they, they really do, yeah. to be honest. So, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, to I some mean, extent, I, yeah. To some extent, what, what is true with flat space holography, what is somehow a, a connection that I can definitely see is that the free model is some kind of Corollian theory. And to some right. extent, this, this boundary theories are very yeah. much Corollian theories. So to some extent, it, that there seems to be some connection in terms of right, right, right. the fractals so, but, are stuck but, but, to a point like, like like theories living on scratch. Or something. So I guess in that case, uh, you are setting the coupling lambda to zero, correct? Correct. In order correct. to get in that, that's a special case. That's a very special theory in some sense. Exactly. Yeah. This is some of the, the theory that has maybe one thing that that is interesting here, and also a little bit unfamiliar here. You have this interacting theory and the free theory, uh -huh. and the free theory has much more symmetry than the interacting theory, if you like, right? Because right, you yeah. have. Here you have suddenly like boost symmetry because here you have like bo uh, Corollian boosts. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 yeah. And even much more because you have actually like infinitely many boosts. You have some kind of super translations, if you like, that you don't have. Right, exactly. It's really yeah. this interacting term up here that breaks all this down to just having the dipole symmetry. So, some, so to some extent, to me, it seems the free theory of fractons is very much related to theories yeah, that yeah, could lead yeah, different yeah, spry, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, I think that the theory down here at, for mass zero is really something people have written down as a co candidate for. Yeah. There have been recent papers on conformal Corollian field theories. Yeah, and I yeah. think this is exactly one of the theories that are written, is written down there. So there, there yeah. seems to be some connection, but yeah, it's true. So you have the real dipole symmetries. You have this, this to break it down, you have this the extra, extra yeah, so I I would say that these theories are kind of theories that naturally live on Sky Plus, but I don't know whether it is very clear that they are like uh, holograms of the theory, right? I mean, these are just free theories that one can write down there. So it's not okay. like uh, that's it's more like the ability to define a free conformal field theory. Correct. It's not like uh, you can infer, at least at this point to me, it's not key how you could infer a lot of the bulk from yeah. writing down the theory. It, it's like something that the theory reduces to if you go very far away or something right, like right, this. Right. It is something I could imagine to be very true. And I think it's so, something people have l at least said in the literature to my understanding. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that's all I had. I mean, I just wanted to kind of get a general idea about this. Uh, whole no, no, thing. sure, yeah, no, no, yeah. Thanks for the great questions. Okay, so uh, any other questions, anybody? If not, then uh, yeah, then we can just uh, thank Stefan. So thank you very much for thank you very much. Talk. Thank you yeah. very much. So I will stop the recording.